Welcome back. Another episode of Conversations in Artificial Intelligence. So how did you get involved into AI? Well, it came much as a surprise for me. Um, I have uh, learned AI from the scratch. So to, to, be, to be quick, uh, I did not go to computer science school. So I was recruited by a friend when I got out of video game programming school, which is a bit out of context. And for him to say, I need a coder and I need to do some stuff. Are you able to read Google stuff? And I said, yeah. And so I just said, okay, what is it? He said, oh, it's machine learning. I didn't knew what machine learning meant. If I knew, I would probably not have gone into it at the first place. And then I just learned things, just learned stuff. So then I learned about to do NLP, to how to treat language, how to understand language. And I became pretty much passionate about it. Can you give us, if you know, like some, some measure of the actual costs of data breaches for these industries? What we, what we have come to know is that in Canada, uh, in a general sense, on the average, uh, it costs $10.6 million to a, a small Canadian company when they get hacked. But this is a national average. If we can go on to a more precise case, let's say we could say the Marriott Hotel. They lost more than 50 million IDs. And as they were an hotel company with their private clubs and premiums, and they had the passport of these people. They could not know which passport has been compromised and which didn't. But to not take any chance and to do a good PR, they decided to replace all of them. So it has cost an average of $30 billion, which is a lot of money. The problem is how do you deal with this conundrum in which the medical owner, the medical data owner cannot give you the data. So you, you don't have the right to protect your investor or to protect the people that have put money into your company. You don't have the right to just give your IP like that. So what do you do? One of the two parties must trust the other. And this is a big problem. Each time you have to find an agreement, you have to find big contracts and NDAs that doesn't protect much because the one who has the most economical power will always win in such a in such as and stand out. At one point, you will need to put all your data on this uh, either Microsoft or Amazon or, uh, or any other structure for that matter. To, to use your data on their system. And all these have terms and agreement generally in which it does not guarantee protection to your data. So you will need to have uh, an insurance in which you can say, okay, I am the owner of medical data in the jurisdiction of Canada, and I have uh, enough guarantee so that it's gonna be regulated for me to put all the hospital server data into Microsoft Azure. So it is still a, a complicated thing. So it can work for some company, but it doesn't necessarily fix the problem because this is not a marketplace. It is not a, a place where uh, the algorithm seller can say, okay, put your data into this place and you can use my algo, but I have insurance that you can do nothing else with my algo and you have insurance that I have never accessed your data. So there is a one approach that has been proposed a few years back and that has worked very, very hard for the moment. It is called homomorphic encryption. It is not very intuitive. It is a very complex technology, but for now it doesn't fit the solution because it is not uh, performing well. It is still very slow and it is still only able to deal with some type of variables. Another solution that has been proposed are fully centralized systems such as uh, what you say with Microsoft Azure, uh, with the IBM Watson environment uh, and all these environments, they are made as centralized point of control that has these big labs and the big security, physical security there. So what they're going to try to say is, look, the guarantee is you have all my quality insurance that the data will not be compromised. But still, it doesn't fix the problem of transmitting data and it doesn't fix the problem of terms and agreement and knowing that your data will never be used by a third party and that it could not be snooped upon while you are sending it to, let's say, Microsoft or to this new cloud and to Amazon or DigitalOcean or any other provider for that matter. We have to see here that often when we speak about blockchain, people 
and wants to figure that it is an entire solution. Blockchain in this case can only fix part of the problem. And so what is special about the digital distributed ledger and blockchain? The real special thing about it is the unicity. So what some people like to call the immutability of data. So uh, to make it very simple, when you have distributed ledger or blockchain, everyone is sharing the exact same set of data and with some cryptographic magic, they can always confirm to each other that they have the exact same order, the exact same data within the exact same time frame. And if someone goes out of this, it becomes rejected from the system. And so what we have seen with the blockchain is the ability for people to trade assets from a peer-to-peer -peer position, meaning that I can send you uh, something on the blockchain, which would generally be considered as a token or an asset of data. And I can be sure without using any other one, any other party or any other trusted person, I, you can be sure and I can be sure that I sent it to you. So this create the possibility of, of creating escrows. I, I like to call them escrow. I know that escrow is generally uh, the concept of I give money into the escrow and when condition A, B and C is good, the money is triggered to be released to Mr. X or you. So you can create conditions in which money is going to be transmitted to someone or another, but it doesn't have to be money. An escrow can be tough for data too. So you can have data that is stored, but that will only react to some specific triggers. And that these triggers are mathematics, they are smart contracts, they are not humans. So they cannot make mistakes, they cannot be corrupted, they cannot forget something. The worst that can happen is they have a technical bug. I think that Singularity.net is doing a good job for now at creating this uh, infrastructure layer in components, if you prefer, or SaaS environment in which people are going to be able to leverage this technology to fix the solution. But in the short term, I think it's more like there's a new business opportunity. Do you ambition that there is a full solution in the horizon or, or you think uh, this is still far from coming. There's a new business opportunity that has been created in which someone or many people needs to arrive with a service that could be pretty simple. Uh, so some, some centralized service could be pretty simple to say, okay, I am the escrow between some people that needs to sell data or host data, mine data, do transformation on it and others that wants to sell capabilities of an algorithm that needs some specific inputs into it. So there's a business opportunity. I don't see that a lot of people have gone into taking this opportunity uh, because the data market is still new. Uh, we, a lot of people don't know yet how to, um, how to tackle all the challenge that makes the data being siloed. Because the reality for now is that most of the available data is not used because of all the reason we stated before. And so uh, the business opportunity for now is to create this equivalent of an escrow. I truly believe that blockchain can help. Uh, when we were working on VNet, we have developed a vision on how to create this middle ground between the seller and the buyers and that this middle ground responsibility will be to give guarantee that security is respected that legitimacy ownership of data is respect and ip is respected that transaction can be verified confirmed and that are protected by consensus so we, we need to have a system in which you can build trust because you cannot play with this data you cannot get it wrong